Welcome back. You're watching Mornings Live with Tinika and Will. Now, Will, there's something strange happening in the skies in New South Wales. It seems the Central Coast has become a huge place for UFOs to come and hang out, really. Just, just the place to be for UFOs. Each month, as many as 30 people turn up to meetings organised by the UFO Research New South Wales Centre to share their out-of-this-world experiences. We have on the line Doug Moffat from the UFO Research New South Wales. Doug, tell us a little bit about what UFO Research New South Wales does. Well, basically, we put together a place, a safe place, I guess, where people can talk about their experiences or try and understand the, well, the phenomenon better. <clears throat> Pardon me, uh, just to, uh, try and understand the phenomenon better. So we put on conferences from time to time and uh, regular meetings and that sort of thing. So, you know, we do what we can to try and, as I said, again, create a, a safe place where people can talk about this because um, it's not everywhere you can. Yeah, very true. It, 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 it's an interesting uh, phenomenon in that uh, we in the general public probably see one or two uh, incidences on uh, shaky handheld cameras or mm. mobile phones in the media and all of a sudden we think, hey, there's millions of, of, of sightings and things going on. Has your research uh, demonstrated a, an upsurge in the number of, uh, of things in the sky that people have spotted recently? Um, not recently, but I think if you look at um, historically the, um, the graph of, say, sightings, you'll find that um, there are spikes and troughs. Um, you know, in France in 1953, there was uh, a lot of landings of craft. Now, why France? Why 1953? No one knows. Yep. Um, so there are peak years and trough years. So uh, that's the way it is. Now, with the Central Coast, for instance, it's not as though, you know, go take your deck chair and go to the Central Coast and you'll see a UFO. <laughs> it's, there are flaps of activity that maybe go no more than seven to ten days. And this occurred in late 92 and late 95. And so for a period of seven to ten days, there was intense activity. And, uh, and then it just goes away. Oh, is that right? Okay. So why, why would it happen at this certain time? Do you have any uh, theories behind it? Why that spike happens? Yeah, why, why they all come at one time or one place? Is it because, you know, they can be seen more because of clearer skies in a certain area? Or why do you think, is there any reasoning behind it? Well, I don't know. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that the visibility is good for that period or that there's anything to do well, from our end. It's to do from the phenomenon's end. Mm. So why it occurs like it did, like it does over that period, I don't know. But it, it's to do with that end of the phenomenon, not our end. So um, I don't know. I mean, one could could purely speculate, and mm. I am speculating here, that maybe if such things as wormholes are means of travelling from one point of the universe to another, which many scientists have, have theorised, that maybe these wormholes ha have periods of time where they operate. Mm -hmm. in certain areas where you can sort of, you know, use them in certain areas and then you can't use them for several years later. I, I don't know. Uh, Doug, there was a lot of uh, speculation about a certain image that, I, that doubtless you saw that came out of Sydney just yeah. recently. Uh, a lady in her car on a, I believe it was a handheld mobile phone. I, yeah. I, I just, in, I'm, I'm fascinated to know, we all, there's a lot of armchair experts out there and, and indeed those that are more qualified too that have had their say. What opportunity is there for, for you guys at the centre to uh, do some independent sort of research and uh, either discredit or, or make viable a bit of footage like that? Uh, we do have people that do analysis on it through like Photoshop and stuff like that. Yep. Um, but at the end of the day, most of these photos are inclusive, yep. no matter what sort of analysis you do on them. Yep. Um, it's difficult. I mean, you know, uh, you can see what they can do with computer graphics these days. You know, not that I'm suggesting this was computer graphically enhanced, but... Sure it does make it difficult to try and prove something. You can Basically, you can prove what it isn't, but you really can't prove what it is. I think um, the object itself, when you, uh, <clears throat> when you view the brown object, it looks rather fuzzy, but when you look at it before the pixelization gets too bad by zooming in, it does appear to have a very faint halo around the object. Mm. Um, now, my speculation, again, is that possibly if the propulsion of this craft was electromagnetic, it creates ionisation of the atmosphere around the object, which creates a distortion much the same as looking through frosted glass. So it can make the object appear hairy or fuzzy when in fact oh. it's a round ball. Well, that's really interesting. Fascinating. I want to know, Doug, have you ever seen a UFO? No, I haven't. I haven't. Mm. Um, have you looked? <laughs> well, I, I think they find you, really. <laughs> You've got to be at the right place at the right time, like winning a lottery. But... Mm. Um, you know, after 17 years of, of being involved with this, or 18 years now, 
um, and talking to people and, and knowing that these people are genuine, you know, and, mm. and I had no explanation for what they've seen and I've rung up physicists and spoken to them if I don't know and say, well, can you give me an explanation? And, and they don't. They can't give me an explanation. So um, there's definitely a mystery going on and um, there's a, there was a group of um, uh, very high-powered people selected, handpicked by the French government to do a report called the Cometa Report, C-O-M-E-T-A, in, in the late 90s. And these were the head, former head of the French gendarmerie, the head of the uh, French equivalent of NASA, and, mm. you know, minister for uh, armaments, and, you know, the list went on and on, really. Yeah, yeah. High-powered people. And their report, which is online, their summary of it, came out and said that ET visitation is quasi-certain, and, <clears throat> pardon me, and that the French government, and in fact the world, were not prepared on any level for contact. Not to suggest contact's going to happen tomorrow, but if it did, uh, we've got no plan. Oh, that's scary. And that was tabled to the French government. That, that's, that's fascinating, and I'm sure, I mean, there's, there's so much that's been uh, uh, speculation that's come out of uh, fiction, and uh, what, what could be going on and what uh, happens in the uh, secret holes of government. Uh, that said, um, I'm sure on some level something like this gets discussed, debated, and some certain cases do get reviewed. But I just wonder, when it comes to sort of framing a strategy for contact, how, how do you possibly go about developing something for meeting a hypothetical someone that you have no idea what form, what manner, or what way in which that'll mm. take place? It'd be very, very roughshod sort of work, wouldn't it, Doug? Well, I mean, look at it this way. 200 years ago, when the British arrived in Australia, they had smallpox, which made them sick. Yep. But when the indigenous people of the country contacted, uh, contracted smallpox, they died. Yep. So um, this is the sort of thing, even if okay. they landed and said, oh, we're very friendly, you know, shake their hand and we're here to help you. And they have something which is for them like some, no more than a cold and um, ends up, you know, wiping out three quarters of the population of the planet. Hmm. I mean, oh. little things like that yeah, need okay. to, to be addressed. Well, that's quite scary, actually. That's quite a scary um, possibility that if, you know, they were to come down, that something like that could happen. Um, I mean, you've obviously been, you know, saying 17 years been working with these kind of people, hearing experiences. What um, has been the most common experience that people have said when they've seen a UFO? Is it the kind of typical shaped UFO with the alien, with the, you know, the typical image we have of what an alien mm. looks like? Or what is the most common thing you've heard? Um... It's very difficult. I haven't had a lot of people. To, uh, most people have these experiences and not are dealing with, uh, the, you know, the aliens themselves or mm -hmm. so-called, you know, ETs themselves. Yeah. It's a fairly rarefied field. So most of the time people are seeing craft, sometimes very close, um, and, and sometimes it's a bright star-like object that moves around. They, they come in all sorts, sorts of shapes and sizes. Most commonly it's the spherical type thing, but then again it can be cigar-shaped or round. It depends on your perspective how you're viewing it. Um, also, but we've had some that are shaped of dumbbells and all sorts of things. So, you know, they do come in all different shapes and sizes. Just lastly, Doug, before we do let you go for this morning, uh, uh, I, I imagine there'd be instances where you'd have to sort of check things with uh, the government or the military because you, you, you've had reports or you've seen vision or footage of something flying about the place. Do you get much cooperation from the authorities when it comes to sightings that they might say, hey, oh, no, this was just a, a, a weather balloon, to use a famous example, or this was a, uh, uh, any number of other things? Do, is there much cooperation in that sense? Um, oh, look, they're cooperating to, to the extent that they have to, but, I mean, there's no interest there. Sure. Um, you know, they're not sort of, you know, oh, yeah, I'll help you out sort of thing. It's more like <clears throat> public service. You know, if I have to check, yes, no, there hasn't been a weather balloon. Thanks very much. Bye. <laughs> Um, wow. Yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much it. Well, at least you get through, so obviously the public service up in New South Wales isn't too bad there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, thank you very much for your time this morning. It's fascinating work that you do, and uh, hey, I, I'm on the side hoping uh, something gets verified sooner rather than later, mm. because it's, it is absolutely fascinating stuff. Thanks, Doug.